Um, okay, hi everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Um, this is a um, entirely optional presentation, which I'll call a lesson zero, which is all about um, how to fast AI. Um, it's all about how to get the most out of this course, um, how to make sure you finish it, and how to make sure you feel like it's been a productive um, time. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because a lot of people who take the course, when they get to the end of it, they say to me, oh, it wasn't until I got to the end of the course that I realized how I should have done the whole course, and so now I'm going to go back and redo the whole thing over again. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about what the messages I've heard are, about what people have found most, the, the best approaches to making the course work. Um, I'm also going to go through the actual mechanics of how to get set up um, with two systems, uh, Google Colab and AWS EC2, and I'll talk about why you might use one versus the other. So a lot of people now, as in many hundreds of thousands, uh, have gone through the Fast AI Practical Deep Learning for Coders course, and um, many, many, many of them have gone on to create successful startups, to um, write research papers with high impact factors, um, to create new products at their companies. Um, you know, it's a pretty well proven course at this time, but there's also a lot of people that never finish the course. Um, and so if you're watching this, it's because you've decided you do want to learn deep learning. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about like what's, what's it going to take for you to be one of the people that, that makes this into a great experience. Um, when I talk about the course, um, I'm also talking about the book. So just to be clear, there's, there's a book that Sylvain Gougera and I wrote, um, which you can either buy from Amazon, and uh, people like it happily, um, or, believe it or not, you can read the whole thing for free. Um, so it's called Fast Book. It's a Fast Book repo. Honestly, I make basically nothing from the book, so don't feel like you need to buy it to say thank you or something. Buy it if you want the book. If you're happy using notebooks, use the free one. It's all good. Um, so the book was actually written as Jupyter Notebooks, um, and was we wrote something to turn it into a, a book book. Now the book also, by the way, actually looks great on Kindle, online, as well as paper. I know often technical books don't. This one actually does. Um, and then the course um, goes through half of the book, okay? And so it, uh, uh, quite soon we'll do a part two, which will go through the other half of the book, plus some other new stuff. Um, but basically each lesson covers a, a chapter or so of the book. So if you're doing this course, you'll be going through the book, at least in the notebooks, and you might want the paper one as well. So here is the main thing that you should commit to right now, which is to finish the damn course, right? And or finish at least half of the book. Um, because Everybody, I think, who joins comes in thinking, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do deep learning, but if you, if, when I look at our YouTube analytics, a lot of people don't finish, okay? So you just need to decide, what day are you going to watch the course each week? What day are you going to do the assignment? What day, like, how are you going to structure your time to finish the course? And maybe you're coming in deciding, I, I, I don't want to finish it, which is fine, right? Um, may, you know, and if that's your intention up front, no problem. But if your intention is to be a really effective deep learning practitioner, you need to finish the damn course. Okay, so so put it in your head that that's your goal. Talk to your friends or your spouse and tell them that's my goal. Get that social pressure that you're going to finish it. And you're not just going to finish the course, but try to finish a project. Right? So Christine McLevy is one of our um, fantastic alumni. She's now at OpenAI, one of the world's top um, research organizations. Um, she built a fantastic uh, system for um, creating new music with deep learning. She used to be a pianist herself. Um, and I remember this discussion. I told her, um, focus on making one project great 
and polishing it off and finishing it. And, um, and she did. And, and that project has ended up creating music which the BBC Orchestra played, right? And amongst other things helped her get this extremely exclusive job at OpenAI. Um, so this is a, a clip from a um, podcast um, with one of our students, Sanyam, and Christine, in which Christine is saying this is one of her key insights. And so I'm going to be giving you a few key insights, some of which are from me, or some of them are from me via students, um, but they're all like things I've heard a bunch of times. And so this is one, one example. So finish the course and finish a project. The project doesn't have to be something no one's ever built before. Maybe it's just like, oh, I really love that thing that person built. Gosh, it would be a real stretch if I could build it too. You know, it, great. Or it doesn't have to be world changing. You know, so one of our students built something uh, for his fiance, uh, which was a uh, cousin recognizer. He had, I think, 14 cousins. And so his fiance could look at, could take a picture of one of the cousins and it would tell them which cousin it was, right? Um, uh, in our first um, course, one of our students built the app for the Silicon Valley TV show, which did Hot Dog or Not Hot Dog, um, which was a, actually a huge smash hit, it's like millions of downloads, and it was written about in the media. And it did exactly one thing, just to tell you whether or not something was a hot dog. Um, anyway, or it could, you know, um, solve medicine. That would be fine too. I mean, whatever. Um, so finishing the course means being tenacious. And um, one of the things I hear a lot is a lot of the um, approaches people learn as they do fast AI around how to learn and how to study are useful more generally. And in fact, um, this is a um, quote from our book. Um, the, the number one thing I see the difference between successful deep learning practitioners and, and not is tenacity. Okay, And tenacity is on the whole something you can choose. Now, something you can't choose is whether you find yourself in the middle of a global pandemic, or, you know, somebody in your family dies, or you come down with a terrible cold, or whatever, like, obstacles happen, right? And so part of being tenacious is being understanding with yourself, right? And saying, okay, something's happened, I can't do what I hope to do right now, but then getting back to it, right? So part of tenacity is not about ignoring the bumps, but keeping going after the bumps. And maybe that's, you know, quite often I'll have a bump that's like a year long, right? But if I've decided to finish something, you know, at the end of that year, I'll go back and finish it. Um, it's So sometimes that involves me emailing somebody more than a year after they've <laughs> sent me something and saying, okay, I'm ready to reply now. And they forgot that they even sent me an email. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you um, a bunch of insights from this book called Meta Learning. If you haven't seen it before, that's okay. It came out yesterday. Um, and um, it was written by a guy called Radek, who is one of the um, top alumni of this course. And um, it's a book well worth reading because his journey is extraordinary. You know, this is a guy. Um, without a degree, who couldn't code just a few years ago, uh, with a job that he found boring, and he set out to, to learn deep learning, and um, repeatedly failed to do so. Um, but um, Radek is extremely tenacious, and each time he failed to do so, he tried again. Um, and eventually he figured out a way to do it, and the way he did it um, was very it, it, intensely based on fast AI, both the course and the philosophy of learning. And uh, he is a he is now a Kaggle competition winner. Uh, he was um, the only uh, non San Francisco person at QAI, which is one of the world's top medical AI startups. And now uh, he works at a new nonprofit that is literally trying to translate animal language. Um, and uh, is, is so he's kind of 
a good example, like I always think it's a good idea to have a role model and in the fast AI community there's a lot of role models. And so here's somebody who's like both a role model for like trying, failing, trying, failing, trying, failing, and then, you know, um, finding some success. And so um, I'm going to show you some things from, from his book. Um, and a lot of his book is him, him taking stuff I say and kind of casting it into what he took away from it. Some of it's his ideas. Um, so one of the things we hear again and again from unsuccessful deep learning students is they keep preparing to do deep learning and they keep preparing to do projects. So they study linear algebra, they study calculus, they study C++, they study all these different things. They do a MOOC and then another MOOC and then they read a book and then another book. You know, and at what point are they actually going to start doing something? So the fast AI philosophy is you start doing something week one, okay? So week one, you need to actually train a model, okay? Um, which is not to say that you're not going to learn theory, you will, right? As needed in the context of getting stuff done, okay? And so if you do finish it, right, particularly if you finish the full two parts of the course, right, you'll have implemented basically all of FastAI's library just about from scratch. You'll know all about batch normalization, you'll have benchmarked various matrix multiplication approaches, you'll know how to write bare metal GPU optimized code, you'll understand how to do back propagation and the calculus of that from scratch. Um, you'll do all of that, okay, but it'll all be as you go along in the context of like solving a particular problem or understanding the next piece of the puzzle. Um, so yeah, really just reading books and watching videos um, is not going to get you there. The thing which um, is going to get you there is writing code, doing experiments, and training models. Some of you might not be that great at coding. Um, fine, okay, that's that's a perfectly okay place to be. Um, and um, But you guys are going to find it um, the most challenging because being good at coding is the thing that lets you zip through quickly. So rather than think, oh that's a shame, I'm not that good at coding yet, this is actually an opportunity because now you have a really fun project to learn to code in. So a lot of people have become good coders by doing the course, because as you do the course you'll learn about a lot of computer science concepts like object-oriented programming and functional programming and mapping over a list and list comprehensions and um, GPU acceleration and so on and so forth, right? So the thing is though if you're not um, if you come across a computer science concept or a programming idea or a piece of syntax that you're not that familiar with, that's a place it's worth pausing for a moment, okay, and making sure that you know um, that you do understand how that code works because the code coding is the kind of critical foundational skill. This is a pretty good course for getting started with basic computer science. It's Harvard CS50 course, which everybody. Uh, at Harvard um, does for computer science um, to get started, and that's all available for free online. Um, so I would recommend, well, and so would Radek, uh, start there. Um, and so these quotes are all from Radek's book, by the way. Um, and then uh, the other piece, so Radek talks about this four-legged table of the things that are going to help you do your deep learning experiments more effectively and efficiently, and these are the ideas, like knowing the basic ideas around code, knowing your tools, so an, an editor, Jupyter Notebook, um, knowing stuff like Git, like how to save your work and, and pull in other people's work and so forth, and understanding kind of SSH and Linux, like how to access a server and manipulate it and do stuff with it. Um, so there's this great um, course called The Missing Semester of Your CS Education, which was actually created, I believe, by students at MIT who said, oh, everybody at MIT is assuming we already know this stuff, 
but a lot of us don't, right? So there's nothing to be ashamed of if you've never used Git or you've never used SSH, you know, or whatever. Um, they're just tools which, at some point in the journey, most people will just kind of have to figure out, right? So this is actually a great time to do it, and this is a great course uh, to use to to help you get there. Um, and of course, again, the main thing is to to practice these tools. So that's the kind of foundation around coding and your kind of development environment. Um, the, the next big piece of advice, um, which we talk about a lot in the course and that Redek talks about in his book, is um, sharing your work, communicating your work, um, and writing about your work. Um, this is something that a lot of people feel very uncomfortable, like tweeting or blogging or whatever, right? Um, it's like, who the hell am I to start writing about deep learning? I've just started, right? Well, um, here's the thing. Um, no one is better placed than you to write for, like, what would you have wanted to know six months ago, right? So you now know more than you did six months ago, and you'll know more in a week, and more in a week, more in a week. And so if you are um, got a background in, say, the hospitality industry, you know, you could probably write something very interesting for your colleagues in the hospitality industry about ideas around, around deep learning, for example. Uh, or if you teach at high school, you know, you might have ideas that you can write down about what high school students might find interesting, or teachers might find interesting. So, you know, everybody's got something to say. And the key thing is to, to, to write it down, because that is going to help embed your understanding a lot better, and it's going to start to build up your um, portfolio. Okay. Um, and so we'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, a lot of people have found that this message of sharing their work has been a critical part of their journey of learning and of also building up their personal brand that has ended up getting them a job. Okay, so what does it mean to do a fast AI lesson? So a fast AI lesson is basically a chapter of the book or one video from the course, um, or both. So what does it mean to, to do one of these lessons? Um, assuming you're doing the video, then it means, okay, obviously watching the video, so there's a couple of hours, right? And then it means um, running the notebook, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, when you run the notebook, you have the whole book with all of its code and all of its outputs there, you're playing with it. Um, you should experiment, right? You should, you should try things out. So if you wonder, oh, why is this done before that, we'll try removing it. Try doing it in a different order. If you're wondering, you know, what would happen if I did that but this to, to this other image, try it, right? The more you can start to experiment, the more you're feeding your brain with these kind of like your own deep learning happening in your brain. Input output patterns. You try something, what happens? You try something, what happens? So after that, um, the next step is to try to reproduce the notebook from scratch. Okay, um, now and you're going to have to look things up, obviously, but the idea is can you, with a, a, a fresh new notebook, can you, um, can you go back and recreate some of those models, retrain them, or redo some of that data processing pipeline. So try to like type it in yourself, you know, you can switch back to the answer um, as much as you like, but you're really trying to start to actually, you know, fill in your own, write, write your own code. And then what you really, the point you really want to get to is repeating some parts of the lesson with a different data set which you collect or download. Now, this whole process often takes people a number of times through the course, right? So often 
the first time through, people might just watch each lecture and try and kind of run it and, you know, just get to the end to get a kind of a general sense of what's going on. So people will often kind of go through the whole thing like three times and then come back and try to go further and further, right? So don't worry if you can't do all this right away. Um, certainly in lesson one, that's going to be challenging. Just take it as far as you can, right? And as you go along, try to push yourself to do more and more. And you could even go back to an earlier notebook and see if you can understand more and more of it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's the course, okay? And um, here's the lessons, which you can watch. And then here are the places you can run the notebooks. So there's two um, types of uh, platform for running the notebooks. There are notebook servers. These are things that as soon as you click into it, the actual environment we, environment we use, Jupyter Notebook, will pop up and you can just start running it pretty much straight away. So that is obviously the easiest. Um, Colab is free. Uh, Gradient uh, has a free tier um, and SageMaker um, is not free. Um, so we're going to look at Colab um, today. Um, the other option is to use a full Linux server, and this is something where you're going to have to basically set up Linux and install the Python system and install notebooks and get the code from GitHub and run the server and log into it with SSH and do all that. That's obviously a lot more work. Um, you might want to skip it for now in like lesson one, um, but I would recommend at some point um, you go through this path. And the reason why is that in real life at your workplace or if you do your own startup or whatever, this is what you'll be doing. You will be interacting with a Linux server using SSH that's running a GPU and you'll want to understand how it all works. And once you're using your own Linux server, you'll suddenly learn about all these productivity enhancing tips and tools that make your life easier. Um, so um, I'll be showing how to set up AWS EC2, that's the Amazon platform today. Um, you'll find Google Cloud looks very, very similar indeed. Um, um, Jarvis Labs was created by a FastAI alum, and this is probably at this stage the best value of the full Linux servers, um, so that would certainly be also very much worth checking out. Um, one good thing about AWS, uh, so a couple of things, AWS is currently the most popular platform for cloud computing, so it's very likely that whatever company you're at or end up at is already using it. Um, uh, they're also pretty generous with credits for startups and students. Uh, so even though it can set you back, you know, 60 or 70 cents an hour, um, you might well find you can get a few hundred dollars worth of credits through your school um, or even a few thousand dollars worth of credits um, through their startup programs and so forth. Um, so let's have a look at what uh, Colab looks like. Um, so Colab is, uh, it's, it's wonderful how easy it is to get started. Um, you literally just click on the chapter, so let's do chapter one, and it pops up Colab. Um, you can pay, I think it's $10 a month for Colab Pro to get like longer sessions and more likely that you'll get a better GPU, but for most people you'll find the free version is totally fine. Um, one of the biggest problems with Colab is that it's not persistent, which is to say when I go to this notebook, it thinks it's never seen me before. Nothing's set up for me the way I want it. But we've set up the notebook so that the very first cell actually installs everything you need. So if I click this little run cell button here, it will run the cell. Although what I will do is I'm going to pop over to 
Scilab here, and let's also read the steps here. And actually, it says here, before running anything, you should tell Colab you're interested in using a GPU. So, if you find that um, when you run a cell in, uh, in the, from the course, and it's going to take like half an hour or an hour or more, it's very likely you forgot to use GPU. The GPU runs things many hundreds of times faster. So all you do, as it says here, is go runtime, change runtime type, and say GPU, okay? So now I can run this cell, and um, this is all Python code, except lines that start with an exclamation mark are actually sent to a terminal, okay? So the pip is something that installs Python software, and FastBook contains all of the Python software necessarily necessary for the course. And so it's going to go away and set it all up. And so this is this like mildly annoying bit. Um, you can then um, connect Colab to Google Drive, and that's going to be how you can save your notebooks and save your work as you go. Okay, I'm not going to do that right now, um, but if you go to this link that it says, and it'll give you a code, and then that'll connect it up to your Google Drive. Um, and so at this point now, everything from the for the course is now available, uh, and you can see the whole book is here. Okay, uh, so here's the book, and um, you can open up se sections to read them, okay? Um, you can go to the table of contents, okay? Um, and so eventually we'll get to this cell here, which contains all the code needed to run a model. So if I click run, here is where it goes. Now, um, this is going to, um, it's amazing how much this little bit of code is going to do. It's going to download um, tens of thousands of pictures of dogs and cats. It's going to um, uh, use a simple rule to, to recognize the dogs from the cats based on their file names. Basically the way that this this has been set up is that you can tell from the file name whether it's a dog or a cat. Um, it's then going to download something called a pre-trained model, which is something that already knows how to recognize uh, various types of um, images. Um, it's then going to construct, that's going to then going to train that model to make it particularly good at recognizing dogs from cats, and then it's going to validate that model to see how good it is at recognizing dogs from cats using a set of pictures that it hasn't seen before. And that's all happening. So, so far it's already downloaded the data set, it's already downloaded the um, pre-trained model, and it's now busily um, going through the first epoch, which is to look at every picture once to try to learn how to recognize dogs from cats. Um, and, and that's it. The uh, lines starting with a hash are just comments. Um, because this is also the source of an actual book, there's a few like slightly weird comments that you can ignore. They're just things that are used for setting up references in the book. Um, there's the caption, so forth. Okay, so it's now um, testing out, I think, that first epoch. Okay, so it's finished an epoch, and so far it's got a 1% error rate. So after 54 seconds, um, it has learnt to recognize dogs from cats with 99% accuracy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're going to let that finish off. Um, so that's how we get started with Colab, okay? And uh, there's nothing else to, to set up. Um, um, now, what you can do um, is you can um, open notebook, and you can open a notebook from GitHub, and here is the um, 
FastBook repository. And you'll see in the FastBook repository, for every notebook, there's a second copy inside the clean folder with the same name. There's also a so I was just looking at O1 intro. There's also a clean O1 intro. If I open that up, you'll see that it's got exactly the same thing as the last one I was just looking at, but all the prose is now missing. It's just got headings and code. Also, all the outputs are missing. So the reason that we have this clean version is to help you with these stages here, is our suggestion is once you've gone through the lesson, and you've run the notebook, and you feel like, okay, I think I get it, is you open up this clean version, and before you run each cell, try to think, okay, why is this cell here? What's it for? What's it going to do? What's the output going to look like? Right? So once you remove all that context, this is a good test for you to kind of get your brain going to think what it was actually going on. So this is a kind of much more active approach to, to reading and recall. And so then once you've done that, um, and you've finished going through this, at the bottom, one thing that is kept is the questionnaire. So at the end of every chapter is a questionnaire. And so then, at this point, you should now, as much as you can without looking, go through and try to answer each of those questions. They all have answers in the notebook, in the book, okay? So you can, you know, if you can't remember, you can always look it up. But, um, you know, if you can't remember, that's a sign to you that like, oh, I'm, you know, did I skip over that bit too quickly? Like, what, what's happened that I've not remembered? And then try to remind yourself, and then go back and, yeah, finish the questionnaire. Okay, so there's a lot of pieces to help take this from a passive, I'm just watching a video, I'm just reading a book, into a um, participatory exercise that you're a part of. Okay? So, um, as soon as you can, um, we want you to create something that's yours. And so, this is the easiest way to do that, is basically at the end of lesson one, once you're kind of up and running, try to do it with your own data set. And um, if you go to uh, forums.fast.ai, um, which is something that you're going to want to be deeply familiar with, because this is going to be full of people just like you, um, other people who want to learn deep learning. Okay, and um, these people are all asking questions and making comments, and you can see there's like a lot going on all the time. And so you can see here's the part one course topic, um, and you can see there's 1.4 thousand topics there, and each one is going to have lots and lots of replies. Um, so this is where, amongst other things, you'll find if you search for it, something called Share Your Work Here, which has 2,000 replies, and you can see links to and pictures of lots of examples of things that other people have done after the first week or two of the course. And so hopefully that might help give you some inspiration. Okay? And um, it would be great if you could reply and add a, you know, a picture or a link to what you build. And you'll see, you know, everybody is very positive to each other, on the forums in general, and in this topic in particular. Nobody's going to go, oh my god, I could have done that years ago, right? Um, people are going to be excited for you, that you have now joined the ranks of people that have built their first deep learning model. And I will be excited for you. So as I said, um, Radek, um, this is again from his book, um, um, expresses in his book a way of not doing fast AI, which I have heard now probably hundreds of times. Um, I don't know why this is so common, but many, many people do what Reddick did, which was um, basically to learn all these math things, right? So he started with calculus, 
Um, and then once he got to a certain point in calculus, he found that he had to start understanding real analysis. And then as he started understanding um, real analysis, he had found he had to learn set theory, you know, and you get the idea, right? If you want to learn all of math, that's going to take a while. Um, there's a lot of gatekeeping out there that says like, oh, if you're going to be a real deep learning practitioner, you have to finish, you know, a graduate level course in linear algebra. Here's the truth, the actual linear algebra you do in, in basically all deep learning is matrix multiplication. And if you've forgotten what that is, that is multiplying things together and then adding them up. Okay, so what you need to be able to do is multiply things together and add them up, all right? So if you can do that, you're good to go. Um, so yeah, don't get, you know, you're not going to finish it if A, you never start it because you keep preparing, or B, you keep thinking, oh, I wonder exactly what's happening here, and you go all the way down to the bottom until you found yourself in the midst of set theory, right? Don't worry. You'll get deeper and deeper over time, but if you're learning mathematical theory, you're not coding, you're not experimenting, you're not practicing, you're not actually building deep learning models, and if you're watching this course and your goal is not to build deep learning models, you're in the wrong course, okay? And if your goal is to build deep learning models, then don't do this. Um, So, as Reddick says here, it's as you train actual models that you're going to get feedback, right? And the feedback that a lot of people get is, oh my god, I can already train useful models. Like a lot of people are surprised at how early on they can actually get astonishingly good results. Okay, so, so you know, jump in and be open to surprising yourself that you can do a bit more than you thought. Um, you can't do everything right away, okay, but, but start that feedback loop of figuring out what do you know, what can you do, what can you get working, what can't you get working. Um, so one of the key things that you're going to need to do if you're going to finish all of the course is become an even better developer than you are now, even better coder than you are now, wherever you're up to, and so to do this, you need to read code and write code. Um, the fast AI source code is designed to be extremely readable, so you can read that code. You can obviously read the code in the notebooks, um, um, but yeah, you want to be spending as much time as possible reading and writing code, uh, and particularly reading and writing deep learning code. Um, all right. How do you find out what's going on in the world of deep learning? And how do you get yourself on the map of people doing deep learning? Um, the Probably the best answer is Twitter. Um, for those of you whose only knowledge of Twitter is uh, the Kardashians and Donald Trump, this might come as a surprise. Um, but actually, um, uh, to create this slide, I opened Twitter and I copied and pasted the first three tweets that appeared on my screen. Uh, so one of them is uh, somebody as a discussion about costs and impacts of different approaches to labeling. Uh, this is a fast AI alum who's a 17 year old PhD graduate who's doing well, uh, who has shows how to mix PyTorch and fast AI. And then uh, Hilary Mason, who's a professor, well, I guess not a professor anymore, but now in industry, um, talking about uh, organizational issues in data science. So, you know, there's a whole world out there of um, machine learning um, on Twitter, and there, you know, if you want to get your work noticed, that's a great place to do it, because really everybody, everybody's there, okay? And if you want me to highlight your work, you know, um, that's where I can see it, and I can retweet it. Um, so, yeah, Twitter is uh, a really good place to be. Um, if you're just starting with Twitter and you don't know who to follow, uh, go to my Twitter, uh, go to my likes, and go through my likes and find tweets that you think you actually like that tweet too, and then follow the person who 
did that tweet. Okay, and pretty quickly you'll have a hundred people you're following. Okay, and then you'll they'll retweet things, and you'll find other people you like. And before you know it, hopefully you've got a nice big lot of interesting deep learning stuff to read every day. At first you'll understand like one percent of it, um, which is fine, but you know you're there, you're in it, and it'll be all washing over you. And you'll start to find the people who write stuff you find engaging and interesting. And you'll also find the people that actually you don't, and make sure you unfollow them so that you don't have your feed have stuff you don't care about. Um, so then beyond Twitter, um, you want to start blogging. Okay, and again, blogging is not about writing what you had for dinner. Okay, it's about writing something that you of six months ago would have found interesting. Okay, so you know more than you did six months ago, so write that down. Um, uh, we have something called Fast Pages that makes it ridiculously easy to start a blog, um, and so you, there's no reason for you not to, you know, at least create a blog. There we go. And one of the nice things about Fast Pages is you can even turn Jupyter Notebooks into blog posts, so it's, it's great for kind of technical ones. Um, so this is what a Fast Pages blog looks like. This is a Fast Pages blog about Fast Pages. I had to write Fast Pages in order to write the Fast Pages blog about Fast Pages. Um, uh, but basically, it, and one of the other nice things, it's all in Twi it's all in GitHub, right? So it's as as you're blogging, you're learning more about Git. Um, it's all written with Markdown, which is something that you're definitely going to need to know anyway. So as you're blogging, you'll be learning about a lot of the tools you need to learn about anyway. Um, So um, one interesting idea for things to blog about is um, this example from um, Aman Aurora, who um, is an um, Aussie fast AI alum who uh, is now working at Weights and Biases, which is one of the top AI startups in the world. Um, um, this is a really interesting kind of blog post. What Aman did was he took a video that I did at the launch uh, here of the Queensland AI Hub, and he wrote down what I said. Um, and that's uh, an example of something that you could do. If there are videos out there that, that you liked, and nobody's turned it into a post, be the first to do so, um, because there's all these benefits. Um, when somebody s sends me something saying, I've written up this talk you gave, um, I'm very grateful to that person, because now my talk is now available in a second medium, and a lot of people prefer to read rather than listen to a talk. Um, you know, that person's taken the time to do this, they've given, taken the time to have me check, you know, their work. Um, um, and kind of everybody ends up winning from this. So I've seen with um, Aman's uh, uh, post about my talk, uh, it's got attention from people that my talk didn't. So for example, I noticed on my LinkedIn feed, um, the CEO of Data61, which is uh, uh, the CSIRO, so the top data science body in Australia, highlighted it and said, check out this post from Anna Aurora, right? Like, so this is like an example of the kind of stuff you can do. It's like, try to be helpful, right? And at the same time, you're also learning. So there's an example of an interesting kind of blog post which very few people are writing, and so there's a huge amount of opportunity here for you to practice your your writing. Um, okay, now, um, what is the difference between machine learning and other kinds of coding? Um, as Radex says in, in this chapter of his book, um, the key about machine learning is that we can generalize. Um, we can uh, train a model with one set of data and apply it to a, a different set of data and still get good results. And everything just about that we're doing in this course is all about creating models that are going to generalize well. And we're going to be learning about how you can measure how well your model generalizes. So answering these questions about 
can we trust our model to be correct on new data that we feed it is absolutely critical to, to every model that you build, whether it be in a Kaggle competition or a little prototype or um, a production model you're creating at work. Um, one of the most important things here is creating a good validation set, and this is something that you'll, you'll hear about in lesson one of the course. Um, but you know, I really wanted to highlight it here, as did Rudek in his book. Um, it's, it's a really important idea is you need a good way to measure whether your model is any good. So you need a data set that really represents what kind of data is your model likely to have to deal with in real life. And um, uh, my partner Rachel wrote this really great blog post on the Fast.ai blog about this. And actually, interestingly, you know, this was um, kind of came out of a, um, a lesson that I did at the University of San Francisco, and then Rachel turned it into a blog post, and Rachel's blog post has ended up much more influential than my video ever was. You know, so this is actually a good example of what I was talking about. Um, and she took it a lot further. Um, okay, the next key thing um, that Radek mentions, and I totally agree with, is um, it's hard to write correct machine learning code. Um, I always assume that every line of machine learning code I write is wrong, and I'm normally correct about that. It normally is wrong, because there's lots of ways to be wrong, and unlike creating a, you know, a, a, a context management app on the web, or whatever, it's much harder to see that you're wrong. You know, you can't see that the name didn't get stored in the database, or you can't see that the title isn't centered, right? Often it's wrong that it's going to be like half a percent less accurate, you know, or your image is upside down, but it's kind of, maybe you didn't even look at it, it got straight into, sent into the system, and you end up with something that can only recognize upside down images, or whatever. Um, so, um, whenever you're doing, um, you know, whenever you're building a project, make sure you start with a simple baseline, right? Like create the simplest possible model you can that's, that, you know, solves the problem so simply that you can't have made a mistake. So often that'll be like just taking the average of the data, or if there's two groups, take the average of each of the two groups. Um, or you know something that something really really simple, and then you can gradually build up from there. So another very common beginner mistake with projects. Remember, we want you all doing projects. Is somebody in a project group will say, "Oh, I read about this new Bayesian learning thing with these clusters and this you know advanced transformers pipeline, and we could put all that together, and it's going to be better than anything before," and they then spend months creating this complex thing, and at the end, it doesn't work. Now, why doesn't it work? Well, I don't know. It's so big and so complicated, maybe it was a stupid idea. Maybe there's a bug in one piece of it. Maybe that one piece there shouldn't be there, but it should be somewhere else. I don't know, right? That's not how anybody creates successful machine learning projects. Machine, successful machine learning projects are always built in my experience, by creating a simplest possible solution that gets something all the way from end to end first, and then very gradually it makes it incrementally slightly better. Okay, so um, keep that in mind, right? You might feel a bit silly when you build that first model that just takes the average of the data, right? But that's how that's how the pros do it. That's how everybody that actually gets it to work does it. So often I've had, you know, Silicon Valley startup hotshots come to me and ask me to like check out their amazing new startup, and I'll ask them, you know, oh, you reckon this can separate, um, you know, sick people from well people or whatever? Have you taken the average of each of these two groups and compared that to your model, for example? And they'll say, oh, no, and then they try it and they find out their model's worse. Right? So you you need to know whether your model's actually doing something useful. Um, for projects, 
one of the things you might want to do is join a Kaggle competition. Um, that might be the last thing you see yourself as doing, as being a Kaggle competitor, but actually um, this is one of the best possible projects you can do because to enter a Kaggle competition, even to come last, you have to go through the entire process of downloading a data set, formatting it into the right method ready for a model, getting it through the model, saving the output, getting it into the correct submission format, and submitting it back to Kaggle. Right? So getting a, um, a model actually up onto the Kaggle leaderboard, it's really going to test out your end-to-end -end understanding. Right? And once you've done that, you can start to iterate, you can start to make it slightly better, slightly better, slightly better. So although in a lot of ways Kaggle is not representative of the real world, you know, you don't have to worry about deployment, you don't particularly have to worry about kind of inference speed, stuff like that, and in a lot of ways it is closer to the real world than you might expect, in that it really does force you to go through the whole process, and also to think about engine, about kind of planning your project carefully. So um, enter a competition with your kind of goal that I, I want to win. Right? Now obviously on your first one you're not going to win, but the whole point is it's a competition, so you're going to try to do your best, right? And so to do your best, join a competition that's early, right? Give yourself plenty of time. Um, and every single day, try to make a small improvement. Um, and then you'll find that, you know, if you keep reading the forums on Kaggle and keep in trying a bit more every day, you'd be amazed at the end of the three months how much you've learned, how much of the stuff that at the start you thought, this is, I have no idea what's going on, and then you'll realize, oh, suddenly I, I do know what's going on. And you might find you get in the top 50%, which might be better than you expected. Um, so that this is, you know, highly recommended at some point during this course, is uh, have a real go at a Kaggle competition. Um, so at the end of all of this, um, you might be looking for a job. Um, now this could mean a number of things. Um, a lot of people just want to bring some deep learning into their current job. Um, and so, you know, that's, if your organization's already doing some deep learning, that might be easier than if it's not. If it's not, you might just have to start prototyping some things and try to build up some kind of, you know, proof of concepts internally. Um, or maybe you're going to try and go out and get a, get, you know, get a new role um, as a researcher or a data scientist or whatever. Um, most people are not going to be able to rely on their, you know, um, Stanford PhD to get them there, right? Um, most people are going to rely, have to rely on their portfolio. So your portfolio is going to be all the stuff you build along the way. It's your footprint on the deep learning community. And that footprint is going to include, you know, think, things like your contributions to the Fast AI forums, and your tweets, and your stuff on Discord. I would say pretty much every one of the Fast AI alumni that have come to my attention as being thoughtful and effective community members all have very, very, very good jobs now. Um, and so, like, people really, really notice this footprint, right? So your, your blog posts, your um, GitHub projects, these are, the, these are the things that are going to get you a job. Um, they probably won't get you a job at a big company, a big old company, in a, you know, kind of standard established IT job, right? That's going to go through HR, and HR are going to, like, they're not going to understand any of your GitHub code, or know any about your community impact. They're just going to know about credentials, right? And you'll come up against somebody with a Stanford PhD, and they'll get the job. 
right? But um, startups, particularly startups from other people who have got similar backgrounds, of which there are many, um, are going to appreciate you. Or companies that don't really have an established AI group yet. Uh, or the startup you build yourself will certainly appreciate you, right? Um, so it's, um, you know, the, the more you've got a portfolio and that you can show that you've really built stuff, um, the better, and so start early.